Welcome back to the Sports Docs Podcast with Dr. Katherine Logan and Dr. Ashley Bassett. On each episode, we chat about the most recent developments in sports medicine with experts from around the country. In episode 12, we're going to continue our discussion with Dr. Eddie Chang and focus on the use of blood flow restriction therapy for both upper and lower extremity conditions. Most of the literature about BFR focuses on the effects distal to the site of occlusion, but what about proximally? Our next paper explores that question a bit further. From the August 2021 issue of AJSM, the article is titled, Blood Flow Restriction Training for the Shoulder, a Case for Proximal Benefit. This randomized controlled study compared the proximal muscle change after eight weeks of combined upper extremity BFR and low intensity exercise versus low intensity exercise alone. Patrick McCullough and colleagues at Houston Methodist concluded that the addition of BFR to the proximal arm resulted in greater muscle mass in both the upper extremity and the shoulder region, as well as increased internal rotation strength and endurance. Acute occlusion was associated with increased proximal muscle activation as measured by EMG. The author suggested that occlusion-adduced distal fatigue may contribute to enhanced activation of proximal muscles to compensate for fatigue of the distal muscles. We'll then shift our discussion to the use of BFR for lower extremity conditions, specifically after ACL reconstruction. Jorge Shala and his team published a systematic review titled Perioperative Blood Flow Restriction Rehabilitation in Patients Undergoing ACL Reconstruction. This review concluded that data on the use of BFR after ACL surgery is very limited and mixed, but that most studies found significant benefits in muscle hypertrophy, strength, and pain scores. Then, from the March 2020 issue of AJSM, we wrap up with a randomized controlled trial titled, Blood Flow Restriction Training Applied with High-Intensity Exercise Does Not Improve Quadriceps Muscle Function After ACL Reconstruction. Curran et al. randomized patients to one of four exercise groups— concentric, eccentric, concentric with BFR, and eccentric with BFR. The exercise program was initiated 10 weeks post-op and continued for eight weeks total. The authors reported no difference in muscle volume, strength, or activation at any time point across all groups. So I think now would be a good way to transition to um, upper extremity conditions. You briefly touched upon um, kind of using tourniquet for a possible proximal benefit as well as some other upper extremity conditions. Do you routinely use BFR for any upper extremity, shoulder, elbow, wrist conditions? For the most part, I don't use a lot of uh, BFR in the upper extremity. The one area that I probably do it most is about the elbow is lateral epicondylitis, um, whether it's uh, rehab or post-surgical as well. And then distal biceps repair when they're you know, just beginning that strengthening phase, usually about, you know, 10, 12 weeks out when I'm starting to do, let them do a little bit more resistance um, is uh, probably the only two times that I've, you know, thought about using BFR. Uh, there are, is talks like one of the papers that you presented uh, about using it for proximal benefit in the shoulder itself. And uh, which, you know, a lot of professional baseball teams use that for just for kind of management, uh, which is you know, something that would be very interesting to look at in the future. Yeah. yeah so Eddie, you, man- you mentioned that your sort of early exposure was with um, Dr. West and uh, the Washington um, Nationals. So, and she was using it a lot with pitchers. What sort of diagnoses was this um, with? And, you know, kind of talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, it was, it was more for routine arm care uh, f- uh, for the uh, for the pitchers, and again, this is the first time I had no idea what they were using. I was like, "Why is there a tourniquet on this patient uh, on this <laughs> player?" But it, it was more for routine arm care. The day after the pitch, or two days later, they would just have the BFR on and just do simple, you know, rotator cuff type exercises, external internal rotation, scaptation, things like that, uh, and just to get a little bit of some low load resistance training in um, and and not stress their shoulder too much so that's that's when i that's the most i've seen in the shoulder to be honest and especially for you know, rotator cuff uh type uh conditioning but i on, other than that you know i haven't seen too much uh on it i think that's really cool what you mentioned about um for tennis elbow or lateral epicondylitis and distal biceps like lateral epicondylitis i feel like is one of those conditions where it's just nagging like it sticks around it really bothers people mm-hmm. and the thought of using that um, preoperatively even as part of the conservative treatment is really appealing. You know, I'm sure you both kind of throw everything you can at tennis elbow to try to avoid surgery. That's like another thing that you can add that, that may help that. 
Yeah, and, and I think um, if um, if you combine that with some sort of other therapeutics you know, outside of just a standard physical therapy, if uh, a lot of my patients that go to PT for a tennis elbow um, get dry needling very routinely, um, uh, whether the data shows that that's very beneficial or not, we can debate that. But uh, you know, a lot of people tend to like it and feel better, which is just the most important thing. And I think you stimulate that area uh, with the dry needling plus adding BFR, uh, you you may create that response that you're looking for to hopefully you know maybe accelerate you know the recovery for it. Yeah, um, and plus or minus the biologics and yeah, yeah, sure. I think there is always you know you're sort of going through with the tennis elbow patient. Here are like all the tricks that I have, and you might you know some of these might work for you, some of these work for your neighbor, you know, and it's sort of variable and, but it's a very frustrating diagnosis. So I think the more we can kind of investigate and, you know, offer the better, um, cause there it's true. There's just not a ton of options. And when I was a PT, we were still doing iontophoresis on it, which oh, yeah. makes sense. You know? <laughs> just, You're just trying to do as much as you can to <laughs> get that patient, you know, better and, and not come back to your clinic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's a very frustrating diagnosis. Yeah. <laughs> so ultrasound, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of maybe a more fun diagnosis, well, maybe not for, for patients, but ACL. So you recently published, or I say you recently published, but also presented on um, the use of BFR for ACL at the AOSSM annual meeting in Nashville. Can you give us a little bit of a backstory about um, this paper, like, uh, you know, methodology and, and briefly on the findings? Yeah. Um, so this again all goes back to when um, I met uh, Johnny Owens uh, about BFR and chatted with him a little bit more about why he's using it, when he uses it, and he initially started using it for uh, in the military and for limb salvage, try to really uh, build muscle after that, and uh, then he moved on to post-operative patients and even uh, kind of older geriatric patients as well, and. Our therapists just started because of our affiliation with the Nationals. Our therapists have been using you know, BFR early, pretty early on, and I wanted to know more whether or not this actually works or not. And um, if you and like you say, all the systematic reviews, all the data looking at post-operative um, use of BFR, it's everything is very heterogeneous. You know, you're debating about what tourniquet pressure you want to use, what cuff size, diameter. Uh, how often you're doing it. And so, you know, we decided, hey, why not just do, we have 10 centers that use BFR in physical therapy. We have a pretty large group that does ACL reconstructions and uh, our patients will likely stay within our system. And so uh, we just devised a randomized controlled trial looking at all patients undergoing ACL reconstruction and randomized to get uh, BFR uh, or not. And so the, you know, our principal findings really were that at three months postoperatively, uh, patients uh, that had BFR uh, and uh, used demonstrated significantly greater uh, terminal knee extension, which is our measure of quad, sh- quad strength um, uh, compared to the control group, which just got standard of care. And the other thing, and this has been validated in a, lot, a few other studies, that patients pain early on after surgery. Uh, seem to improve a lot. Uh, their VAS, VAS scores uh, improved greatly compared to the control group as well. And so those are kind of two things. They sort of normalized um, the pain scale normalized uh, at the end of our study. But because um, again, most patients do feel pretty good at about three months post-op. But that was a pretty cool finding that, you know, at six yeah. weeks out, their pain level is a lot better. And if your quad is working a whole lot better and you're just beginning that gait walking phase at six weeks, uh, you're not going to have that patellofemoral pain. Uh, right. So uh, I thought that was a really interesting finding that I wasn't expecting. Yeah, I think, you know, I always sort of in that early pre-op, whether they sort of like hear me or not, or they're listening to this part, but with ACLs, I sort of always have these things like, you're going to have like front knee pain, no matter what graft like we choose, because you're going to get to this period of time where you're going to start to feel a little bit more normal, and you're going to start doing too much, you're going to stand too much, you're going to walk too much, you're going to, you know, and your quads going to get tired. And then you're just going to have front knee pain. And that's just an expectation um, 
that, you know, nothing really bad, you know, nothing bad happened to your ACL. You didn't do anything wrong, but there's a balance there, you know, of how much you should load and how much you you have to build up that quad endurance and quad strength. And I think that's a great side effect, you know, yeah. of just being able to reduce that, I think is a huge part of their recovery. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and so I, I, that was just such a, uh, interesting finding that we had and, it made me actually think about, you know, we routinely uh, at our institution unlock our brace pretty early on after ACL surgery. And, yeah. you know, I have some uh, people I know that unlock at week one. Um, and, and so, but I worry that my patient's quads are not quite there to be able to walk with their brace unlocked. Yeah. And so just thinking about that a little bit more too, about protecting that quad, letting it build, you know, um, I've been locking them up a little bit longer than, you know, I'm not sure how long you guys do it, but I, I say, you know, if it's not ready yet, go up to two, three weeks, you know? And, and yeah. Um, I think, you know, I always leave it a little bit um, open, you know, of just sort of, I want you to have good quad control before we start. Yeah. Opening. I, I guess I should say I make the decision more open, not the brace more open, but the, yeah. um, you know, just to say like, what does your quad look like? Cause I think you're absolutely right, Eddie. It's just, it's a little bit individual of how well or, you know, how um, good is their quad control and that's going to change how they feel. You know, do they have that front knee pain? Like, do they have that gait? Are they now starting to have hip pain because they're like thrusting their leg around, you know? Yeah, I do similarly. I do like, I'm a little conservative. I do earliest would be two weeks, to be honest, just because I yeah. worry about them doing too much. And at the range, I've seen people where you're right, they can't strike straight, straight leg raise without an extensor lag at still at two weeks. And there are some where they're like motoring into clinics. So mm-hmm. I feel like I, I'm in close communication with a lot of my PTs. So they'll reach out to me and say, hey, this kid's doing great. He's, you know, eight days. Can, can we maybe unlock the brace a little earlier? And I'll say yes, but I'd rather it be that way than someone unlock it and then try to walk and have their knee buckle. Right. Yeah. And I, yeah, I've been more, I started out very aggressive, oh, actually pretty conservative. And then very quickly I moved to aggressive because I wanted to be like everybody else. And now I've gone back to being a little bit more conservative because I just don't, a lot of my patients are just not ready to walk with the brace unlocked seven days post-op. Um, okay. I mean, their bandages haven't even fallen off yet. And so it just, I don't know, for me, I'm just not you know, ready to let them do that. So I'm, I'm more like you, actually. I, I generally keep them locked for closer to two weeks now. Yeah. And I think also, you know, maybe that helps them with their extension anyhow. You know, in that early phase, I'm so focused on, like, you're going to get your bending. Don't worry about it. Like, yeah. I, I want to see you get a great straight knee. You know, I just, like, this is the stuff we have to, like, focus on early because it's just too hard to get extension late. Um, I honestly, so I I unlock it for ambulation around too, but I keep them in the brace locked in full extension for four when they're sleeping because they're worried about them bending. So it's like, even though I'll be more kind of like, uh, like yeah. familiar about them when they're walking. I really worry about that slight when they bend their knee when they sleep. I worry about developing uh, a flexion, slight flexion contraction. Yeah. So even the brain. And post op, I tell the parents or I tell the you know whoever is taking care of the patient. You know, I do want them out of that brace and just put their foot on a chair mm-hmm. and then put like a bag of rice. You know, maybe three or four pounds on their thigh, just to have the passive extension 20, 30 minutes a day. You know, starting even post op day two, uh, just or uh, whenever they can tolerate it, just so, you know, I'm so crazy about it, just like you, Catherine, you're saying, so crazy about extension, because <laughs> once you have one or two that don't get it back, you, you, uh, you know, you're going to do everything you can to make sure that, you know, they get it. Yeah, I think, like, we talk about it so much, about how you can't have a pill under your knee, you can't, you know, yeah. it's in so much of our paperwork. I know Alex, who's been my athletic trainer since the start, you know, it's so drilled in her that they're like scared. They like come into those first visits and they're like, it's straight, it's straight. And I'm like, hey. There you go. <laughs> you always know you're doing a good job when they're fearful of you. Like, <laughs> they come in, they're like, I got to 90, I promise. <laughs> you're like, yes, <laughs> it's good. That means we're doing a good job. <laughs> and we'll be right back. We are super excited to let Sports Docs Pod listeners know about an opportunity to receive a $20 discount on a truly awesome Lots Fit Mini Massage Gun. So let's tell you more about it. The Lots Fit Mini Massage Gun is an easy to use handheld massage device. It comes with four different head attachments for different types of massage, whole body, focal pain points, or spine. It even comes with a heated head attachment for maximal relaxation. I keep mine charged at my work desk and I use it after a long day in the OR. Oh, and you can get it engraved. Mine has my name. 
The Lots Fit Mini Massage Gun is really great to use after a long workout, especially after my husband kicks my butt in squash. Well, he is a professional, Ashley. We'll put a link in the bio, or you can go directly to lotsfit.com, L-O-T-S-F-I-T.com, and check out that mini massage gun and enter the discount code Dr. Logan, D-R-L-O-G-A-N. And we're back. I did have another question, Eddie, about your paper, um, because Catherine mm-hmm. brought up the point. She does a lot of quads. Um, I've started doing quads. I do quads for most of my revisions, and then okay. I do some quads for primaries for people that I worry about kneeling and things. I'm primarily BTB, though. The ACL yeah. spread in your study, was it mostly one type of graph? Was it a good mix? Did you see it? Yeah, it was a – oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, did you see a difference by graph if there was a graph difference? Yeah, there's no um, – so between the – so looking backwards between the control and the um, treatment group, no difference. And then looking at graph mixes, it was um, predominantly all autographed except for I think one allograph maybe. And um, it was majority was BTB and quad, um, very few hamstrings. Um, and I, the data between when we did a subgroup analysis between BTB and quad really didn't show a significant um difference compared to the controls. I would say that the quad patients are a little bit slower um, uh, overall uh, if you match them up. But, you know, when you compare it to the control group, they're about the same. Yeah. yeah. I would think that makes sense. It yeah. Sense. Yeah. yeah. I also just off, off track here. I just also noticed that the, you know, um, because I just started doing quads a few years ago, um, mm-hmm. uh, hamstring was my predominant soft tissue graph if I was going to use soft tissue. And then with all the new, all the you know, new research um, that's been coming out, I've been switching over to quad. But I do notice that actually, Captain, that my patients would flex. They do struggle a little bit with flexion now, uh, which makes sense because you're, you're taking a quad graph. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, their extension actually is it's a lot easier to get extension all of a sudden. Yeah. But I feel like getting flexion still is it's a little bit tougher for them. But they'll get it. I think they'll get it. And then I have noticed that, um, cause at least for ACLs, I think there's a pretty tight group of therapists that we work with. They do, a, um, you know, once that incision's pretty much healed up, um, they do a lot of Graston and dry needling around, mm-hmm. like just superior to the incision site, um, just so they don't get adhesions in there. And that seems to help a lot. Um, cause I think there's a few people that just sort of feel that little bit of that restriction sort of tightness. Yeah. Um, and I know there's a therapist I work with in particular, uh, in Denver who does really long load stretches. Like, you know, I think of stretching as like 30, 30 seconds is a long time. Yeah. And she's like two minutes minimum, like just really, <laughs> wow. and it's brutal. Um, but I don't know. She's always does that routinely with, um, like hip flexor kind of stretches, um, sort of where you're like really opening up, um, mm-hmm. I'm showing you on the cameras if you can see me. Um, but anyway, I, I do think that has helped as well. Um, but I do think the expectation of like, hey, grass and dry needling is sort of part of like that quad recovery has helped. Right. That. I, cause I I only ask because I need some advice because yeah. I have a patient who is about six weeks post-operative from a quad, primary quad autograft, and she's about one ten. Yeah. or so and she is really struggling to get to get you know past that right now yeah. and you know I, she's still relatively early but you know i i was hoping her to you know but it's it's a lot of this kind of pain inhibition as well it's right. not even that she's stuck she's just so scared to go past her so yeah. so maybe i'll talk to the uh, therapist see if they've tried i haven't read the pt no yet but see if they've tried any the grass in or dry needling around that area that and i'm a big person like big proponent of you got to get in the pool like just if you start to have the like they just the person who's like a little scared a little bit maybe um has some pain um and has some like you know just some difficulty with that uh, a couple things i'll do one is i'll have them get in the pool and just do like you know you're standing at the side you're holding the side and you're just squatting um and that seems to i don't know for some reason give them a little bit more control in the exercise they don't feel like someone's pushing on them mm-hmm. um and then the other thing is there's sometimes a subgroup of people that just do better prone. And I don't know why, um, if they just feel more relaxed, but if like their therapist is stretching them prone, I think that helps a lot too. Okay. Well, I'll bring that up because I know they, I've, um, mentioned it to me a couple of weeks back when I like, yeah. hey, just be ready that she's going to 
Uh, we've been struggling with inflection. Yeah. And she's a little concerned about it too. So, okay. I'll, uh, last thing I would say is her, um, patella bones. That'd be something else I check and make sure that like, there's really good patella mobile. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. You know, so Catherine, when you're doing your quad yeah. harvest and Eddie, I guess as well too, are you doing that mini minimally invasive uh, incision using like the cigar cutter harvest? You're doing a longitudinal incision and taking it that way. Cause I feel like that makes a difference. I did a couple one way, a couple the other. I thought there was more scarring with actual, like having, you know, doing the old school way of dissecting. And I thought like there was less when it's that small cigar cutter. I don't know if anyone else has seen that. I, I've done, I haven't done the, the new, the new generation cigar cutter. I've done it in the lab before. It looks very interesting. I, in my, um, in my practice, I've seen, you know, they, they talk about doing that, you know, two centimeter transverse yeah. Yeah. incision. Uh, I did in a lab and I just said, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get I, uh, a, the problem is proximally getting the thickness you want proximally on that quad graph is very difficult if yeah. um, you're not, you know, you're not keeping that blade flat mm -hmm. and uh, with the quad. Yeah. And I just feel like I don't do a good enough job that way. Maybe, maybe my hands are just, I just can't do with it. So I do about three centimeter longitudinal incision. And I just kind of use a, you know, just use a skin window just to kind of get a get proximal and distal, just to ensure I get a good thickness. Because that last thing you want is you pull that graft out. It's a beefy nine distal, and you're looking at like at a seven five proximal. And you're like, oh my gosh, right? And so, um, I, I just, you know, for me, I rather just extend that incision just a little bit more. Yeah. I, yeah, so, I, oh, go ahead, Ash. Go ahead. I, I like, and I'm not, not doing a plug for Arthrex here, but I, I like the cigar cutter. I thought yeah. the, the other one where you were doing the double blade and kind of going, I agree with you. I feel like I needed to, to see this thing. Um, I just feel like once I have it there and I've marked it arthroscopically, like I go in with the camera and I look and I mark it, I feel yeah. more comfortable with it. But I did have one um, guy, so he was a revision and he had a big BTB incision from his prior surgery. And so I just like extended it longitudinally. So aesthetically it would like make sense. Um, sure. I felt like he had a little bit more scarring than okay. the, the what were transverse ones. But, but definitely I see that, that concern. If, if you're, if you deviate even a little ang angling down or angling up, you skive up or you skive into the VMO, yeah. you really can yeah. get a short thin graft and that's obviously not ideal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm looking for it. You know, we don't have that approved yet at our, hospital system which is extremely frustrating we've been on a moratorium for about you know for a little bit now and so hopefully at some point they will let us start using some of these newer generation devices and uh and harvesters because i i do think yeah. that cigar cutter that you're talking about is is going to be great for quad harvesting i think a lot of people who are more into or are interested in quad but kind of hesitant about you know just taking a knife and just slowly dissecting off is going to like to use it just because it's just easy to do uh, and rely and reproducible. Yeah, exactly. I like it. I do um, kind of a hybrid where I'm not doing the transverse. I'm doing a, like a smaller longitudinal. Cause I agree. Yeah. Like I also, if you kind of start transverse and you don't like your approach, it's, yeah. there's really nowhere to go from there. So you can always start with a small longitudinal and then, if you need to make it bigger, you know, it's an incision. It's not a huge deal. And or at least that's Laprade would always sort of, in training sort of say like, why do you, you know, the scar size should be like the last of anybody's worries. Yeah. You want everything to be perfect. And that's, you know, mm. so I always sort of start out with a smaller longitudinal extend if I need to. Um, and we do have the next generation quad cutter and I have to yeah. say it really is pretty slick. Is it? Okay. Um, it's, um, you know, it, the measurements are really easy to read when you're kind of sliding it up. Um, since it's coming out kind of in that tube, um, you have a really good sense of, um, you know, the, just the size of your graft. Yeah. You know, it's obviously like if for some reason you were trending um, kind of like deep or superficial and you're sort of not staying in plane, you would be able to see that. And it also, um, it has like a little bit of a cutting mechanism. It sounds like, Eddie, you tried it in a lab, but yeah. like, so as you kind of move more proximally, yeah. mm -hmm. you don't feel like it takes a lot of force. I don't know that you're going to all of a sudden get off in the wrong plane. Um, sure. So I've been really happy with it. I liked it. Or I uh, like I it. I like well. the idea, that longitudinal idea, Catherine, because I did have one transverse incision where you feel like you mark it, you feel the superior pull up. That's actually quad tendon that's just taut because he's at 90 degrees. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're kind of fighting to get that incision, you know, retracted in theory on the patella. And so, and that's the part where it's critical to get the right, 
dimensions, the right size, the right depth. So I agree. I think, you know, and especially if you know you have to extend, how are you going to extend a transverse incision? Right. You can't. So I think that's absolutely the correct move. Yeah, I just, I think even when I transition to the new quad cutter, I'll probably stay longitudinal. There's just so many more bailout options you have. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, for me anyway, you know, it, I don't think it's that, um, that mini transverse thing is, you know, a tr uh, you know, it's sexy enough to make me want to do it when I, for that one, you know, case that I'm going to struggle in, it's just, you just say, I'm never going to go back again. That's uh, doing that. Yeah, exactly. And then Ashley, you brought up like starting point. I also do um, a spinal needle, like yeah. where I kind of walk it. Like after I make like a really small longitudinal, um, I take a spinal needle and kind of like walk it and make sure like I'm, I know exactly where I'm dropping in. So then like when I do do the double blade to just kind of like mark where I'm going to do, like basically I just sort of walk a spinal needle, know exactly where I want to do my starting point for my double blade. And then I just sort of score it with the double blade. And then um, basically kind of just take it off the patella, put like a number five on it, something heavy, and then put it in the quad um, quad pro. But this, this has gone from BFR to quad ACL, but I'm not sure if you actually going to ask about it. So are you guys taking full thickness grafts? Don't care if you go into the joint, you're closing it up at the end, or are you trying to stay partial thickness? I, I try to stay partial thickness if I can. Um, I will do a, a pre... I'll have an idea usually. Um, if you look at their MRI preoperatively and you measure a couple centimeters above um, the superior pole of the patella, you get an idea of what... Uh, thickness you have of the quadriceps tendon. Um, but yeah, I've gone full thickness once. And, um, but for the most part, I try to stay um, partial thickness. Exactly. We can never not talk ACL, Ashley. I think. No, we the <laughs> <laughs> best surgery ever. Uh, and we can honestly tie pretty much every topic we talk about to ACL. Like rotator cuff repair, we're talking about ACL. <laughs> So let's say, all right, um, I guess the um, before we do our fast five, as far as your BF, BFR study that you pr just presented in Nashville, like what's next? What do you want to learn more about BFR? Like where are the holes in the literature? Yeah, I. so what's next is um, collecting more patients. So we, we're um, starting a second study where we're going to expand over and try to get closer to 100 patients this time. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a little bit of work, but... Um, that's our next step is to do that. And my final thing that we want to look at is um, really the quadriceps tendon patients. So that's yeah. that's an area that I want, whether or not we create a new study off of that or just do a subgroup analysis, I, I want to look at quads just because I've noticed in my patient population that, you know, they seem to struggle the most, um, again, the quad back kind of makes sense. And so whether or not, you know, BFR really, that's, if that's if you're looking at graph choices, if that's the one that it really would be applicable the most to, although I think you know all of them would be um, would benefit from BFR. Okay. Cool. All right, that was awesome. I think um, I'm excited about the future of BFR. I think we have a lot to learn. Yeah. Um, it's really hard to put together RCTs, so kudos to you um, for getting that done. Um, it takes just so much work. And like you said, you started this sort of project a few years ago and it just, you know, that's how it goes. It just to put all the pieces in motion, make sure you're getting your protocol dialed in and, um, you know, even just getting all your consents and your, you know, IRB approval. It takes so much time and so much work. So thank you for doing it. Oh, no, thanks. Yeah, it was a great. I mean, it's a total team effort at our institution, mainly because I want to thank all the therapists that were involved in the study. And they all had to do these annoying measurements every single week, weekly thigh measurements and, you know, checking the um, checking the quad strength and um, range of motion, all that stuff, recording adverse events, things that took away from, you know, some of the stuff they wanted to do. They, they always say, I, you know, initially we had a lot of stuff we wanted to ask and then we narrowed it down because it took 10 minutes out of their 45 minute PT session. So okay. again, I just want to thank all the therapists in our group that contributed on the study. That's awesome. Please make us look good. Yeah. <laughs> what it <boils> down to. <laughs> yeah, I think BFR is really great. I echo what Catherine said. I think, I think the biggest takeaway I've taken from all these papers is that it doesn't hurt. 
um, that it, and it can only help, I think, uh, especially by doing being low resistance, even if the outcomes are equivalent, if it's low resistance, it's less joint loading. I just think that's phenomenal. So I'm a big fan of it for, for everything. I'm excited to see more data to support its use. Yeah. And, and for anybody that hasn't tried BFR out there, I just say, you know, go find out which clinic operates one or, or, and, and try it out for yourself. It's, you know, I just, I just do the one around your proximal arm. And just take a bottle of water and just do biceps curls, uh, 30, 30, 15, 15, 15 in reps. And your arm is going to be killing you by that last rep set of 15. I did. Just try it. it. And, uh, <laughs> and so when I, any, any resident or fellow that tries it in, uh, at our office, I mean, they're like, oh my God, you know, that's, yeah. it really, it really does work. And so I think we need better research. Um, and, and I think based on the trials that I've seen are being done on, on, on the websites that, uh, it's going to come out, I think in the next you know, three to five years. Good. That's awesome. Cool. Right. I right. kick off the fast. Yeah. Five. Eddie, you might may or may not know, we always do like a little fast five to close. Um, and just, these are non-related to BFR, um, okay. to, um, questions. So when you're operating, are you a foot pedal or a hand control guy? So I am both. Okay. And you got to let me explain. And so the, I, I initially trained as a foot pedal guy in residency. And, but I found when I was in practice that when you're using foot pedal on the knees, it's extremely, you know, you're doing that dance where you're trying to you know find where the pedal is. And yeah. that got to be very frustrating. So in the knees, I switched to hand control. Um, but in the shoulder, uh, because you're not really moving around as much, you know, you're not twerking your body in value, trying to put the knee in values in the shoulder. I'm using uh, just foot control um, because my uh, uh, my wand that I use also is, is uh, only uh, foot control as well. So um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a hybrid. OK, that's a good answer. <laughs> um, OK, so in the OR, what scrub shoes are you wearing? Do you have a specific shoe wear? I wear, oh yeah, I wear dance ghosts and uh, I've been wearing them uh, since med school. Uh, I, I did one week of Crocs and my, after I did a Whipple, it was my first surgery I ever did in, uh, when I was a third year uh, med student. And I thought I was going to be, it's going to feel great with these new Crocs that came out in 2007 and my feet were hurting so bad, you know, the next week, I, you know, all the residents were wearing dance ghosts. So I got a pair and I never looked back. What about uh, what's your favorite OR um, or like OR lounge snack? OR lounge snack. Um, fortunately, now we we have a lot of great food in our OR, so uh, I'm very appreciative of that. But when I was a resident, I loved getting peanut butter and saltines. <laughs> that was my favorite. <laughs> and then, what music do you listen to in the OR? Do you have like a favorite Pandora station or Spotify or something like that? Um, so I. I create all my playlists and and so sometimes the nurses ask for something new but it's usually a country a country music playlist is my go-to all right last question what's your favorite procedure um mainly it's maybe a recency bias is i've had a few of these recently but uh, i really enjoy doing bony bank car repairs um and trying to manage the bone loss on the humeral side as well, whether or not you want to add a remplissage procedure. But, you know, I, I do the, uh, the Peter Millet, uh, bony bank, our bridge technique, and yep. it's just so much fun. Once, once you're able to pass the suture passer around the bone block, it becomes a really fun case up until yep. then it's a really tough case. Very uh, well. yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. I've, I've really enjoyed doing, I've had a run of those recently and it's just been a lot of fun, very challenging uh, sometimes, but just a lot of fun to do. Cool. Yeah. Well, it's been super fun to chat. Um, you know, you're uh, really doing some great work um, in BFR and I know we all appreciate it. I'm hoping there's going to be more and more, um, at AOSSM every year and, you know, all the meetings so that we can continue to learn about it and continue to utilize it. Cause I think there's, you know, a lot, a lot of great things that, um, the patients get out of that. Absolutely. And thank you so much for joining us today. It was really great. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to episode 12 of the Sports Talks podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this discussion as much as we did. If you like what you hear, please consider leaving us a review. You can also reach us by email at thesportsdocspod at gmail.com or find us on Instagram at thesportsdocspod. Stay fit, friends.